All right. Good afternoon, everybody. I uh, hope you're enjoying your afternoon here at Nauticon. For our next talk, we have Chris Gates and Vince Marvelli. Chris Gates is uh, most famous as American film director, writer, and cinematographer whose independent films in the 70s and 80s were predominantly exploitation pictures, some of the works of Roger Corman and, and such, uh, and other directors in the, in the 60s at independent studios like American International Pictures. Vince Marvelli is the Phillips DeBias Professor of Material Science at the Technion Israel Institute of Technology, an associate of the U.S. Department of Energy's Ames Laboratory, and professor of material science at Iowa State University. In 1982, he discovered the icosahedral phase, which opened the new field of quasi-periodic crystals. They're here to talk today about client-side penetration testing. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Um, wow, well, I, I got bored with the filmmaking stuff, so I decided to break into computers for a living instead. So, so that's me. Uh, Vince and I co-founded Full Scope Security um, a couple months ago. Yeah, uh, trying to do uh, bring more full scope pen testing to the to the world. Uh, got a blog, Carl Onage blog. Uh, it's doing okay. New member of the Metasploit project. Um, there's Vince. Do you want to say anything? Cool dude. So uh, from presentations in, here's the kind of things. If you, if you get up and leave after this slide, this is what I want you to take home. Uh, attackers are using client side attacks. Uh, does anybody in the room kind of disagree with that? Everybody reading the Microsoft Security Incident Report and all that. So that's what the bad guys are using. Uh, client sides are the new remote. Um, probably not a lot of argument about that. Um, and you should allow your penetration testers to test and use client side attacks to replicate the threat you're facing in your network. And all that is for testing your organization's ability to detect and respond. So rather than one client side attack ruining your whole day and compromising your whole network, uh, let's test those things and then see how we can react, detect, and respond um, instead of just putting our head in the sand and crying. So that's kind of what this is about. So this is a proper model. If we all agree that these things are happening, um, is ignoring it make, does ignoring a problem make it go away? And does not have and is not testing that a good thing to do. So if I take a snapshot in time, I look at your web servers, and we don't and everything's hunky dory. You know your firewall's great. I can only see port 80 in your patch. Is do you really have a secure network? Did you look at what makes you money and how are you protecting that? So that's kind of what we're going to talk about. All right, I get to use the cool old school mic. <coughs> uh, and just to clear things up, in 1984. Or in 1982, I was four, so I don't think that was true. All right, so like Chris mentioned, reality here. Um, remote exploits aren't really what they used to be. Um, way back in the day, web servers were all vulnerable. Um, the, you know, your databases were directly talking to things on the internet. If they weren't back ends, they were right up there out front. Uh, people used FTP all day long, didn't know what secure protocols actually were. So breaking into things, nice and easy. Uh, they're still just as easy, we just have to go about it a different way. So client sides are the way that we're doing it. <clears throat> um, just, just so you don't think that we're making things up, uh, we, we did do a little bit of uh, stat gathering, and we're not going to bore you with these, but eight out of um, SAN's top 20 vulnerabilities are directly related to client sides. Um, and most attackers or researchers are looking at how do we exploit client sides? Because defenses have gotten so much better elsewhere. All right, a lot of red here. So um, in the last quarter of 2008, the top 10 web attack vectors, eight of those were directly related to client sides, could be exploited via client side. So a lot of people look at this and they go, oh, it's web attacks. Yep, but we can also use your people internal to exploit these things. Um, anything from your weak browsers to every Adobe application known to man, uh, and even movie players. So just because you're viewing a movie and you're seeing what you want to see, there could be other things going on in the background. This is good. So question, anybody in here have an uncle in Nigeria that maybe died recently and wanted to send them a couple billion dollars? I do, and he sends me emails all the time. I expect most people in this room didn't open that email or respond to that email or give up the information that they wanted. However, what's frightening is that one in 13 people over the last two years did. 
And that's a very generic, random, you know, nobody's got an uncle in Nigeria doing that, but yet people did it. So if, as a pen tester, you do your proper research up front on a client, and you target your attack directly to them, to what their business really is, using that same statistic, you can assume that at least one in 13 people you're testing are also gonna open your much more targeted email. So we are doing some things well, which is why we do client sites now. Um, organizations finally realized that, hey, we need to actually have a dedicated security team. We need to have our internal network separated from our external public network. We know what IDSs and IPSs are, and we know how to use them. We have dedicated teams using those products. Um, and unfortunately, Microsoft is actually getting a little bit better at getting things patched. So we need to find a weak link somewhere. And that's why we're here today. Uh, everybody in this room and everybody that's sitting behind your computers, they're your weak link. Why are they the weak link and why do we go after them? Well, they always have access to your data. They're connected to your network already. Uh, they've probably added themselves to your local admin group because nobody knows how to configure things properly. Um, and and they're, they're always more gullible than your network admins. They're not thinking security. All they're thinking is, hey, I want to read this. I want to view this. I want to open this because it looks interesting. So they don't care. So let's talk about their desktop. Um, this is what we're going after. Uh, it's definitely much more complex because users have the ability to add everything that they want. Um, it is much more secure from a standpoint that it's behind all those devices, um, which makes it much more difficult for us to fingerprint. Um, but because of users' needs to add whatever they want, um, patching problems with third-party applications, uh, you end up with a whole bunch of attack vectors. And that's what we're gonna talk about here. So again, why are they so, so vulnerable, so complex? Uh, lots of third-party applications, um, not a priority for patching clients over your critical servers. You know, everybody wants to make sure those servers are patched on Patch Tuesdays. Clients aren't so much an issue. They'll get around to them eventually. Um, you know, Adobe versus Microsoft, you know, they have different patching policies. So third-party apps generally become more vulnerable and stay vulnerable a lot longer. Um, and, and a lot of your patching, unless you're an administrator that has a really good handle on the applications in your network, you probably don't have anything patching all your third-party apps on a regular basis. A lot of times you may have to go around manually and get those things patched, so WSUS isn't gonna patch you know, your, your random third-party apps. So does this look bad to anybody? <laughs> so a lot of people may look at this and say, well, that's a bunch of crap, and how could you possibly operate in that environment? Well, I'm glad that people like to operate in that environment because that gives us a whole bunch of attack vectors. If you notice the taskbar down at the bottom, there's a whole crap load of applications loaded, and those all equate to attack vectors for bad guys. So again, why would we want to target a user's access versus, say, exploiting something and becoming a system? Well, users have legitimate access to all of your critical data. So if you see system accessing something, that probably looks a little bit weird. If your user that generally does that on a day-to-day -day basis is accessing that, that's normal. That's okay. Um, there are domain users. So as a domain user, credentialed domain user on the network, you can gather a lot more information than you can as, say, system. You can view other users in the network that turn into additional attack vectors. Um, and the big thing is all of your defenders are looking at what's coming into your network. How many are looking at what's going out of your network? So these users have legitimate access from inside to browse the web, to make connections external with very little filtering in most cases. So in your typical pen test, find this in the back of every hacking magazine, book, known to man. Uh, you do your recon, your scanning, fingerprinting, exploitation, post-exploitation, privilege escalation, uh, and then for pen testers that need to deliver reports, eventually you do your reporting. Uh, we'll, we'll show you a little diagram of how that looks. Got your attacker and your target. And that went a little weird. Um, your firewall in place and your bad guy does his scans and his tags, they all fail because you have some firewall that's dropping everything coming inbound. So there's your typical pen test. Um, 
Your pen tester gives you your, the secure stamp, and then you pay them. <laughs> so in this economy, you know, we don't want to be throwing our money away, and that's really what you're doing here. Anybody with an automated scanning tool can come and do this work and say you're secure. It doesn't mean you're really secure. So in a client side, we do a lot of the same things, but we spend a lot of time up front doing OSINT, you know, gathering that critical information that's freely available on the web so that we can generate and deliver a very targeted attack that helps our success rate tremendously. Um, get all that information, we decide on how we want to do this. We want to send you an email, we want to stand up a real website that you may browse to, send our attack and we wait. Someone's going to open it eventually. Once that happens, secure access and start moving around on the inside of your network. And in most cases, the inside of the network's nice and soft and chewy, so. <coughs> Here is our typical client-side pen test. So same scenario. And we still want to make sure that your firewall is doing its job. So we do our scans, we do our attacks, all these remote things, and they all fail in most cases. Your firewall's dropping them. Good job, you get that stamp. And then we find your weakest link. Stand up our evil website, send our email into those users, wait for the users to open it because it's so so interesting to them. Uh, we drop an 0902 exploit. And we have a reverse shell over 80. It looks normal. It's all encoded. Game over. So in this case, the money that you spend is very well spent. You're really getting the target. You're really getting all of your users tested. You're getting your devices tested. And all at the same time, you're getting a little bit of user training out there. You know, at the end of this thing, we can turn around and say, hey, X, you know, Bob, Joe, and Mary all got owned here, and this is how it happened. So you get to provide a little bit of training in this methodology also. All right. <clears throat> so we spent some time as we've been doing this kind of coming up with some scenarios that um, we wanted to share uh, for other people that pen test or are going to do some work like this in their organization. Uh, so we've got a few things. So we can target specific employees and groups. So um, if the client is deemed that, hey, uh, finance holds the keys to the kingdom, they are in control of what makes us money. Uh, maybe we want to see what we can find out about the finance guys uh, and send them an email. So maybe you want to send them an email with a malicious payload or point them to a uh, malicious website. So your standard uh, Metasploit type thing. Uh, social engineering. Maybe I just want to send them an email and get them to install a rogue program, uh, set up a phishing site to uh, target users and just grab credentials, or do large scale stuff. Uh, generally, that's going to be totally out of scope, uh, but to throw it out there for completeness. Um, you really run into the risk of random people actually getting exploited, which is never good uh, for a pen test. Now, if you're a bad guy, your bad guy is obviously going to go with number three first, right? That's what the bad guys in China and everybody else is doing, right, with the, with the malware, drive-by stuff. All right, I've got one guy up, up here with me. He's paying attention. All right. So escalating scopes within those scenarios. Um, is anybody concerned with gathering user metrics uh, in their pen tests? Do they expect their pen testers to kind of give them met metrics? Do they expect them to, um, okay, good, we got a couple of yeses. Um, what we frequently see is people don't want to have you get a shell back through their network, but they want to know how many people clicked on the link, how many people forwarded the email, uh, where did it come from, did people open it from home, did people open it from the internal network? Uh, so that, that's something, certainly something that as a scope you can offer, offer to, your, uh, to your clients. Uh, the other thing is just to fish for usernames and passwords. Uh, the other one, ex exploit, actually do uh, some sort of vulnerability or a Trojan, you know, run and run malware uh, without an exploit. So uh, escalating scopes, entry points. Anybody using any of that in their network? How many of you are blocking all of those at your firewall? Who blocks office extensions at, in their mail gateway? One guy, two guys, two people. How about uh, streaming media? Is streaming media allowed, people allowed to connect out to streaming media, ASF, MODs? Uh, a lot of that stuff is allowed out and th like either through, through attachments or out. So, you know, a PDFs used to be the safe alternative to office documents. And we saw in the last couple months that they're not. <laughs> So that's been the new hotness. Uh, so all the other things there are all the other entry points to your network. And, and physical, if you can do on site, you know, can you do CD drops? Can you drop a, US, a couple of USB keys in the bathrooms? You know, someone going to go in there and run that stuff. So a couple delivery methods. Uh, we've got email. And the two things within your email for your methodology is open my attachment. So I send, send you the, thi the thing I want you to interact with, or I say, follow my link. 
which leads us into our web attack methods. Our web stuff, phishing sites, uh, send browser exploits, uh, ActiveX controls, um, can I cross-site script you into doing some things, um, SMB relay, which is kind of fixed, but kind of not, <clears throat> or do I just get you to download my malware or just give me information? So again, just different things you can, can do. It's gonna depend a lot on what the users you're targeting are more prone to do, and instant messaging. Bottom line is, I need you to interact with me, and which is not too hard, and that's what we wanna test. We wanna test how, how willing are my users to interact with the bad guy <clears throat> or the pen tester. So some examples that we've been using. Uh, office attachments are great. They're not, like I said, we're, they're not usually filtered at the firewall or the mail gateway. Um, <clears throat> difficult to detect. Does anybody know of any AV that can analyze a macro and see what it's doing? Now, it used to be that the macro creation was, was easy. Now with Metasploit, it's super simple, uh, which kind of sucks because that was the old reliable, but now everybody does it. So from one of our pen tests, we, uh, it was flu shot season. So we sent out a little email and said, hey, uh, hey, here's where you can get free flu shots because everyone wants free stuff. Uh, we had an Excel macro trojan uh, attached to that. Uh, so we had an Excel macro trojan attached to that. And we're going to show a little demo of something similar to that. Basically, the, we had the users uh, lower, lower their security settings, uh, run the macro, and it would send the shell back out to us. Um, so we tested a few things in those scenarios. You know, can users actually uh, lower settings, or users actually opening these things and or interacting with them? Is your firewall and any proxies in place to block that outbound traffic? So in the news, we wanted to say, hey, it just isn't us doing this. Uh, back in the Olympics time, we had Adobe PDF uh, phishing going around. It had JavaScript that would download stuff. It's kind of what it looked like. So malicious PDFs. Again, PDFs used to be the safe thing to open. Uh, another one, attachments, office attachments. This one had the um, jet engine MDB overflow. Did anybody see this one where the LinkedIn stuff was going around? Did anybody get this? This one was actually from my inbox. Uh, I got this too. So it was just uh, an attached list and it had malicious software that would just basically, hey, open this list, run the Trojan, and it was trying to steal usernames and passwords. Um, how, anybody seen any, anything come from Microsoft that's downloaded my patch or installed my patch that I've attached? And this one was kind of cool because they PGP signed it, sort of. I mean, they just cut and pasted a PGP signature, but it's secure. So hey, if your users just say, I've heard of this PGP, I've heard of this encryption thing, this must be legit, someone signed it. All right. So we're gonna do a couple demos. Um, uh oh. So anyway, um, most of the 4Pay frameworks do a lot of this, but we're poor. So I decided to use Metasploit, and I'm a Metasploit fanboy. So um, if you wanna buy us licenses, you can talk to me after. So what we're gonna show is uh, kind of one of the newer features. Anybody seen the new features with Metasploit that will actually dump it to VBScript? Just interact, give me the finger, or shake your head. Okay, cool. Um, all right, good, the demo's working. This is why I recorded them, because I always had demo fail. Uh, so basically what we're doing here is um, creating the actual VB output. It takes a couple seconds for it to actually do its thing. Just wanna make sure that it actually, obviously wanna check to make sure that it actually did something. All right, so it's there. <coughs> And that's our file that uh, MSF payload generated for us. So we take our uh, something worth opening uh, Word document. So once they're done running it, the, uh, they're not too suspicious. So in this case, we would have put our flu shot information in there. So we added our macro code. So basically it's gonna give us a uh, reverse interpreter shell back out can have it do whatever you want. If you wanted to write a text file to the desktop or do whatever, it's sky's the limit on this. It's really what the client wants to prove that you can do. So we're gonna set up a multi-handler to actually catch the callbacks. Most of these file format type ones, and if you wanna have uh, more than one person actually give you a callback, you wanna set up the multi-handler to do that. So we're waiting for someone to open it. 
So would any of your users actually do that? Would they actually enable the macro if I sent them a, an email that was, hey, why don't you go ahead and open this for me? Uh, we found on our pen test that if we can get the mail to actually hit someone's inbox, that we always have someone open it. Um, yeah, 100% of the time. If it, if it actually made it to the inbox, um, they opened it. So kind of what we're showing here is I'm going to show that we close, the user says, oh, well, I was dumb, or I know where to go get my flu shot. Um, and things will still be running in the background. So that may or may not be important to you. So right now we're saying, hey, the, the Word document's still open, uh, and we have our connection. <coughs> I have to look because it's not playing on my screen. So. <coughs> and then we're going to close it and show that we still had our outbound connection. So. One of the other issues we run into with some of the client sides is if you do uh, browser exploitation, it can hang up the browser. When you close the browser, it will actually drop your shell. So you can use some tools. All the frameworks do that. You can migrate off your you know, iExplore to another process if, uh, in user land space and do that. So, so that was that. Um, that that's, uh, I mean, you saw it took me five minutes to generate that, not even five minutes to generate that and use that. So. So anybody heard of the file format exploits in Metasploit? <coughs> Nobody. All right, cool. Um, well, basically what fire, uh, file format exploits are doing is taking the output of what would, was normally automatically served up by the framework and actually outputting it into that file. So PDFs are now outputted to PDFs. Uh, if you have a do Word document, it's uh, outputted to a Word document. If you have a vulnerable ActiveX control, I can output that to HTML. So instead of making you click that link and go to me, I can send you the HTML file. So sometimes people are more apt to actually open that HTML file, right? HTML is safe. Uh, and there's other issues if ActiveX controls are uh, set to not run on the internet, but if I can open it locally, it will open in a different zone. So uh, some, other, some other real fun things to do. A lot of the third-party ActiveX ones will not be marked safe for scripting. So the way to get someone to open that is to send them the actual HTML file and open it locally. And so all this is actually in the trunk. So if you're on the, uh, the dev version, all the file format stuff that is there, it used to be kind of a pain to get it working, but now they've, we've added the API. Uh, and there's actually quite a few, few things there. <coughs> so what we're going to show here is a file format one uh, that was that affected Opera. And it was a malicious HTML file. Basically, we did do a heap overflow with the file. We needed the file extension to show that it worked on all, uh, you know, all, kinds, of process, uh, all kinds of OSs but also show you know, the importance of missing that third-party patch, because WSUS isn't going to patch Opera for you. So if your users are installing Opera, or if your users are running Opera and you don't know about it, you, know, you, you have a vectors, right? So, but you know, Opera is the new secure thing. <coughs> so hopefully these, these are, I've kind of sped these up so they should move a little faster than the last one, because um, you watched me in gory detail how I set everything else up. So you know, HTML isn't evil, that HTML. Tell it what I want for the payload. So it's going to generate it and output it out to a file that you can then uh, send as an email attachment. And that's where it stuck it, you know, Metasploit data exploits. I'm going to set, back, uh, set up the, the handler to call that stuff back. I mean, that, and that was it. Done. So that's a little bit of a whole demo, but All right, so just showing that we're running as as Opera in Opera space. Uh, then, has everyone seen the, all the news about the malicious PDFs? Anybody seen any of that in their network? Uh, we were the client that got just totally hit up with that, right? I mean, it was rampant in the network. Um, and because they were running old versions of Adobe. And uh, that was kind of a nightmare to help clean that up. Um, so again, demonstrating the risk and the issues of third, missing third-party patches or running outdated versions of stuff of a regularly allowed file type. They, were, they allowed PDFs uh, through the mail gateway.
So, so again, we're just generating the payload, actually making the PDF, setting back, setting the uh, callback. So, you know, in real life, we're going to have that callback to us on 443 or 80, uh, something that's going to be not so suspicious. But again, outputs the PDF rule file. Uh, we set up the handler and email it off. We actually saw a lot of reports when I was doing some investigation of what was going on. A lot of people, hey, I'm opening these blank PDFs on the, on the net, all these forums. Hey, this guy's, a, there was an ad network that was actually ser serving up malicious PDFs, and there was all these tech support requests. So I kept getting these blank PDFs opening. I was like, oh, man, that's, that's really bad. It's no good for you. All right, so uh, last demo. Um, kind of what we run into with ActiveX stuff is, Users have to have that, ac that actual control installed for it to be useful if it's any kind of memory corruption one. So if they don't have the con control installed, we're kind of out of luck. And like, we, like Vince talked about, it's very hard sometimes to fingerprint what ActiveX controls are installed, especially in your domain. And maybe you can find that stuff over open source gather information gathering. Generally, we just throw some stuff out there and hope it works. That's really what the bad guys are doing. Uh, I'm going to throw 50 different ActiveX bugs at you, and hopefully one of them will work. So. Um, what we're going to show here is the first time I'm going to show you that what happens when the control is not installed, and basically the browser is going to crash. Uh, and the second time is we're actually going to serve the vulnerable control. Uh, the client, the, the user has to click yes one more time, and then we so we and then then we can exploit them. So we're going to make the user that wasn't vulnerable vulnerable. Um, would anybody see any useful this if you're pen testing? I mean. Are your users allowed to do this? It's one of those things as you tighten down policies, you probably don't want them installing random third-party ActiveX controls if you can help it. So, uh, we, and we find a lot of times that uh, for ease of use for people, they're allowed to do that. <coughs> All right, so we generated the file, call it setting the handler. And we, want, we like to use the reverse TCP because it comes to us instead of us going to it. And cause, right, things are much more easy, less uh, stringent outbound. So you enable, we like to just put in the fish that you may, hey, you may get an ActiveX control prompt. Go ahead and enable that for me because you need to see what's in there. <coughs> yeah, as long as you tell them to expect it, then uh, it's usually not an issue. So we, oh, look, if you missed it, it, the browser just crashed because the user didn't have that, that vulnerable control installed. So what we're showing here is the CSL ID of the vulnerable control. Uh, that's the site that was serving up the vulnerable control. Just as easily be your own web server that you stand up. So that code base equals whatever is where it tells it to actually download the control from, and there's the vulnerable control. You'll see a lot of the full, like Canvas just came out with, Canvas has its own third party ActiveX, or its own ActiveX control, uh, whose sole purpose in life now is to just download their MOSDEF Trojan. So they'll get a similar set of prompts. Do you want to run this? It's signed by immunity, sure. And instead of doing any memory corruption stuff, it's going to actually just download the, the second part of the payload and give you your MOSDEF shell. So it's even better when you can uh, have a control whose whole sole purpose is uh, just to download uh, the malware. So again, similar things, like I said, you want to run it? Sure. So about this point, it's downloading the actual control from that website. And we're getting our shell. So we took someone that wasn't vulnerable and made them vulnerable by the, the fact that they could actually install those types of controls. So um, that was kind of the email attachments thing, which is common. And it depends on your environment whether those are going to work better for you or not. Uh, so some users may be more inclined to click links. So in the web 2.0 world with Twitter, and everything's a tiny URL, you know, maybe that's something to think about is are we becoming desensitized to the used to be what used to be the danger? Don't click on that link. Hover over the URL. Make sure you know where it goes. Um, some of the web 2.0 uh, technologies are actually kind of desensitizing users to that. So because web apps and browsers are complex, they have all kinds of things. Um, 
following links is certainly a way to, to do that. And then, then they typically bypass security because uh, we generally allow people to browse out over 8443 to do what they need to do for their, for their jobs. So if you don't have things like outbound filters or URL filters or blacklists or DNS black holing, you can run into issues. Do you have a, pro you have a proxy in place that's going to detect if something's not uh, actual HTTP or HTTPS going out over those ports? So, um, so I'm going to follow my link, and as we're doing our escalating scopes, so we have password syncs. Anybody have password syncs at work? I had a job, this is my, one of my first emails was, hey, go ahead and put all your credential stuff in there so in case you lose your password. So uh, totally not uh, unheard of to have this asked of your users. And so it takes you to your password sync login, put your username and password in, and then we can log the results. Um, dare I see that? Oh, sorry, I kind of clicked through that fast. Same thing, fish for usernames and passwords, common. Everybody sees this probably every day in their inbox. Um, like we talked about a little bit before, it doesn't always have to be about getting a show. A lot of people, as they ease into allowing testers to do this, really just want to gather metrics on their users. So how many people got the email? How many people clicked the links? How many people forwarded that email? Did it get forwarded, forwarded out of the uh, enterprise to somewhere else? And an easy way to do that is just to create uh, Google Analytics. You, know, you have two tags. You have one for the first page, the landing page. You have another one for the after they've entered in some sort of information page. So whether you're actually logging that information will become up to you and the client and the scope. But worst case is so they can put anything in. Once they hit that second page, we say, yes, they entered in data. And you can give them two sets of metrics. So I sent 100 emails. 50 people opened it and went to the first page. 23 people actually entered in some information. I didn't keep it. Those are pretty good metrics to give to your client. Uh, and then you can ease them into doing the, the fun stuff. Um, web examples, so uh, exploits that actually um, go against the browsers. Uh, some high profile examples there. Most, no, most recently, like your 0902 stuff. <coughs> so thanks for clicking the link. Uh, if you want to be fun, just put your big red button that says don't click me, and then count how many people actually click the button kind of silly, but I think it's that whole thing of don't you tell people not to do it, and they're going to do it just to see what happens. I really want to know what happens if I click this button, and then you get something like that. Um, third party stuff, so uh, Yahoo Messengers, iTunes, um, pretty much every media player has had issues. Um, and are you, again, are you keeping up to date with that third party stuff? Do you allow real player in? Do you have real player as part of your baseline? Are you patching that? There's ton, tons of, ex of exploits for real player. So I, I give you a malicious real player exploit. You think it's good. You're allowing that out. It's normal traffic. Um, and you're doing the same thing. Uh, all, your, all your AVs, almost all your AVs are installing uh, like ActiveX controls to go along with their stuff. Uh, and can, can you find or is there any public um, exploits and vulnerabilities with that? So dot .MOVs, is that norm, usually bad traffic? Yeah, when you get the runtime error, that's bad. But uh, generally, users don't think too much about MOVs being malicious. ActiveX controls, do you want to run that? Most people say yes, especially if you put it in the fish. Um, so here's an example from one of our other pen tests. Um, basically, we just did some stuff that was going on. We were trying to, get a, trying to get an admin to click our stuff. So I said, hey, there's this new Java vulnerability out. I need, you to, uh, I need all you admins, because they had really distributed all their adminning across to little different sections. I need you to check this out, look at the vulnerability, and determine if you need to have your, the systems you control patch that. Here, we set up a local page where you can download this stuff. <coughs> we'll be helpful for you. And so what was on the page was um, this access snapshot viewer exploit, which wasn't a memory corruption exploit. There wasn't a buffer overflow. All it would do is download a, f a file to wherever you told it to. So what I had to do was download to the all user startup. Uh, so next time someone logged in, it ran the malware, and we got our shell. Um, so important. Uh, the important thing is that the users had to enable the ActiveX control. Um, it was it was kind of cheating because it's Office. You know, people are going to oh, it's a Mac, it's a Microsoft ActiveX control, uh, but it was a fairly at this point it was it had been out for a month or two, so they should have been patched up to that, and some of them weren't. Um, so web attacks. Anybody actually using a lot of these any of these cross site scripting shells for anything? Um, I think we found them mildly useful. Not really. They're not they're not probably mature enough to do a lot of things. Um, but beef is really coming along. Now beef, I think, will actually serve up. You can get a user land. Um, cross-site scripting shell, and it will actually deliver the MSO902 exploit to it via cross-site scripting. So it's options. So you can maybe go, if 
you're doing a public organization, I can check xss.com and see if there's any public cross-site scripting uh, for the site already, then I can send them a link with the redirect. You can also just embed your Metasploit payload, any of your web payloads, into that cross-site scripting link and deliver it that way. So we're going to abuse some user trust of, oh, it's my corporate portal. I think it's okay. <coughs> so again, if you're internal, you can do that. Um, Val Smith talked about this quite a bit at his, uh, one of his talks was, uh, can I do script injection? So if I can get right access to the back end, can I just inject an iframe into every page on the website? And that's kind of like a uh, web, a news example of that where that happened. Um, again, you start to run into start ex maybe exploiting people that you don't want to. Um, but it's something to be aware of as a possibility. Uh, and anybody see any of this stuff regularly? Hey, I need to, you need to download this codec, or hey, here's a new executable for Skype. Whatever, I just need to convince the user to install. The big thing is, hey, here's the latest patch. I need you to go ahead and help me out and install that for me. <coughs> or how about antivirus 2009? Anybody running into that? <laughs> All right. I mean, so it works. If, it, if this stuff didn't work, the bad guys wouldn't be doing it. Um, no exploit required Java downloaders. Um, if you keep up with Jeremiah Grossman's uh, top web attacks of 2008, uh, this was like number eight. Uh, basically, there was two examples. This was an old uh, Microsoft ActiveX control that would actually download files, and the other one he used was a uh, uh, Juniper SSL VPN ActiveX control that you could tell it to download files as well. So, so you, you couple that with the ability to, I can actually serve up the vulnerable control to you, uh, you can start to actually leverage some pretty powerful things. Again, that's just downloading the binary and executing it. Iframes, everybody seen that? So. Aside from that being in China, would anybody worry about uh, a blank page or maybe a, a regular page that just had you know, whatever on it? But in the background, we're actually getting hit with quite a number of things. <coughs> There's our favorite real player stuff. And so browser on auto play. Anybody use this at all with the Metasploit? Um, so if, if you're in the position that you actually want to try to do any of this iframe mass attack stuff, you can actually use browser autopone to do that for you. Um, you just go into the config file, and so instead of serving up 20 different exploits, I can maybe pick the top one or two that I want that are, I think your organization may be vulnerable to, and it does, it does some checking, user agent checking, so you know, if I have a Firefox exploit, it will give, do it to Firefox. If I have an IE6 exploit, it will do an IE6 exploit. So that's something to look into if you're trying to replicate that threat and how your clients are actually going to react to that. And Metasploit will do that for you. Whew, I'm done. <laughs> Everybody still awake? All right. By the way, all those videos are available if you want to go learn how to do this stuff yourself or uh, you're having a hard time sleeping at night. Um, Put your ride out. Yeah, what time is it? We got a little bit of time. Um, so all's not lost. There are ways to mitigate these. Um, if you're a network administrator or system administrator that we may come and do a pen test for, please put your earmuffs on. Don't listen to this. <coughs> um, all of these collectively can make a big difference. Individually, people are still going to find ways around them. So it's important to really go through all of these mitigation strategies along with everything else you're probably already doing uh, and, and use them all collectively. Uh, strong baselines, you know, don't let your users enable macros. And if you have security settings that already don't allow them to run automatically, don't allow your users to lower those settings. Uh, don't allow them to install third-party applications that you're not able to patch. <coughs> Spam filters, like Chris said, every time that we've had an email hit an inbox, we've been successful on that pen test for that exact reason. So if that email never gets to the inbox, we might have a much harder time, especially if you have good firewalls in place. Um, outbound content filtering. So a lot of what you can do with Metasploit is just sending these raw connections over weird ports or even if you are using the ActiveX stuff, it looks normal, but if it's going over some random port, then hey, it shouldn't be so normal. Um, standard Netcat, CryptCat, all that stuff, and that's not normal going over 80. That's not normal traffic. So you should be able to filter out non-standard, non-compliant traffic that doesn't match protocols. Um, and that's kind of your content filtering, your egress filtering. Um, Host-based. So even if you have all these great network controls in place, what can the client do itself? You know, can people install their own applications? Can a bad, bad guy run his own malware? So 
host-based IPSs that don't allow code execution. Um, strong group policy, we talked about that already, you know, with office things. Uh, host integrity monitoring. Should I be able to add any piece of software I want onto a box after it's been booted? Is it part of the standard image? No, well, why is it there? Um, and then training. So we all do this like yearly, annual training. Hey, flip through this PowerPoint, and at the end of it, say, yeah, I took my training. I'm, I'm aware of what the bad guys are doing. Well, generally, that's a bunch of crap. So something like this, it really describes all those products that they see on a day-to-day -day basis that really help them understand, hey, this is bad. Um, or doing this client-side test. You know, hey, there's people coming, they're gonna send you stuff, and it might be bad. That's good training for all of your people in your organization. Um, so stepping up the game with your user training could really help out your network. And then we have some inspiration. Talk about? That's my inspiration slide. Uh, I didn't come up with all that on my own. Uh, Lenny Zeltzer's done a lot of good work with doing client side stuff. Same thing for Core Impact. And I believe that's it. So. Uh, there's the link to all the videos, again, if you want to learn how to do it or fall asleep quickly. Uh, we have a little bit of time left if anybody wants to ask some questions. Let's see. All of them? Yes. Uh, again, we spend a lot of time up front doing OSINT, so really figuring out what your organization does, what makes your organization's money. Uh, we spend, I would say, close to 85% of our time doing that before we ever send a packet downrange. Uh, the idea behind that is we don't really care who you are. We want to make sure that you're going to open what we're sending you. I am not a network administrator. Uh, I like breaking them versus fixing them. <laughs> so having a proxy in place is a good step. Having something that authenticates is a good step. Um, there's not a whole lot of you know, open source tools that can get through authenticating proxies. So you're going to stop a lot of script kitties that way. Uh, but specific rules and ACLs for your squid, uh, google.com, I, I don't know. Yeah. I don't have an answer for you. Sorry. Anyone else? All right. All right, well, thanks. Thanks for coming.